All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And this next talk that is sponsored by the Packet Hacking Village. It's more money, more problem. Oh, but actually, I'm wrong. Sorry. It's more wireless, more problem by Jeff Harf. Uh, <clears throat> by uh, Jeff Horvath and Winston Tam. Hey guys doing? Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out to our talk today. Uh, Mo Wireless, Mo Problems, Modular Wireless Security Systems and the Data Analytics that Love Them. Uh, I'm Jeff Horvath from Alsatian Consulting. Uh, presenting with me today is Winston Tam from Uplinks LLC. Hello. So tell you guys a little bit about me. I did 13 years in the Army as an intelligence officer. I did 10 of those years in special operations units. Uh, once I got out of the military, I started Alsatian Consulting, uh, and there's our website if you ever want to check us out. We do cybersecurity, uh, digital signature reduction, personal data protection to private sector and public sector individuals. Uh, I have a BA in political science from Drexel University. I have a master's in information security engineering from the SANS Institute. And with that, I got 10 GAIAC certifications, and there's my analyst ID, so you can prove that I'm not a liar. Uh, I'm a huge wireless enthusiast, and I have two German Shepherds, a 13-year-old girl named Belle and a three-year-old boy named Gunnar. Uh, hey, everybody. My name's uh, Winston. Uh, I am a, uh, I work in software development with my company, uh, Uplinks. Uh, I spent eight years in the Navy, uh, four of those in special operations. Uh, during that time, I was a network engineer, pen tester, and a red teamer. Uh, I also did like three concurrent years as a commercial pen tester for banks, ISPs, and uh, funny enough, like an Indian reservation. They get like a .gov domain, that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, I do uh, DIY tinkering, um, love 3D printing, I uh, have a lot of projects, a bunch of expired certs I don't care about. Uh, I'm a proud Bengal cat dad. Uh, I stopped playing Factorial, I switched over to RimWorld, and uh, but I'm still, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, and uh, I'm a decent rock climber, uh, and yeah, that's how I spend my time. So let's talk about why we did this, why uh, the impetus behind this, this whole project. And me being a huge wireless nerd, uh, I wanted to collect large swaths of data. I want to collect all of, the, all of the channels, all of the packets, get all of the things. Uh, and my initial thought for this was, okay, how many adapters can I actually put onto one computer? Can I just do an all-in-one situation? And if I can, how physically big is that and how much power is that going to take? And what I found is that that then creates a huge issue with form factor because in order to put the requisite amount of cards that we have displayed here on the, on the front on one computer, that's going to be a rather large box. Uh, so there's form factor issues, there were power concerns with it, with getting enough power to, to have that and actually have it be kind of portable. Uh, number of peripheral devices, right, the more things you add, the more the operating system has to take care of and has to keep track of. So the more things you add, the more RAM you have, and eventually you have this incredibly powerful system that really can only do about one or two things. Um, and with all that collection, even if we did get that to work, it, it still has a large amount of data. I mean, think about how much Wi-Fi is flying around right, right now and how much, uh, how much data in a one-hour run you can get if you're listening to every single channel. So we had a lot of large amounts of data that were, were choking my analytic tools. I couldn't put it into Google Earth. I couldn't put it into another app called QGIS. I couldn't put it into Wireshark because they were just too big. And I would end up either having to strip out data and miss things, or I would end up having um, you know, an incomplete amount of data. So my solution to that is building the signal processing and reconnaissance kit yellow, which yes, I know it looks a little orange, but I really wanted the last letter to be a Y and I couldn't think of any kind of tech thing that started with Y. So that's why it ends in Y and that's why I'm calling that yellow. Um, it's a modular wireless collection. Each Raspberry Pi is set to do a different band of the wireless band uh, frequency. Uh, it'll also do Bluetooth BLE. Um, with these Android phones, it will do um, cellular parameters. So what tower you're on, what frequencies you're talking to the cell network on, how good or how bad of service you have, how far you are from the tower, because again, I'm a huge wireless nerd and that stuff really interests me. Uh, it's got 13 Alpha NEH cards, 13 uh, MediaTek Alpha cards, one Wi-Fi 6 card because there really isn't that much Wi-Fi 6 and me being a self-funded guy, I'm uh, not going to waste money buying uh, chips that, I'm, that just aren't going to get used. Uh, and then there are five new like SDRs running, uh, looking for RTL433 compatible devices. Uh, again, these things are running on three individual Raspberry Pi 5s, uh, four Android phones, and the Android phones are running uh, Wiggle and also GNET Track Pro. And then I bag bagged it all up into these REI Trailgate gear cubes and then put all of that into this portable REI Trailgate gear bin. 
So why did I make it modular? Well, one, uh, we talked earlier about the memory requirements for having a lot of devices. If I distribute those devices across multiple multiple uh, computers, multiple um, Pis, I can then, my RAM requirements go down because Raspberry Pis have been able to run 13 wireless cards simultaneously ever since the Raspberry Pi 2. So the Raspberry Pi 5 is more than enough power to handle that much that much traffic. So we distribute it amongst multiple devices. Uh, I don't have a need for live processing. I don't need to see my data come in. I'm gonna do all of my analytics on the back end when I have everything merged together. Uh, so I don't need to set alerts. I don't need to have a GUI. I don't need to have anything. This is all just a fire and forget headless collection system. Uh, this also reduces bottleneck because now I don't have all this stuff feeding into one device. It still has to keep track of all of the other all the other devices and all of the other peripherals that are attached to it. Uh, that also uh, allows for a little bit of more robustness because if I have an issue with a collected file, if I have an issue with a collected database, uh, I may lose that entire day's run. I may lose that entire day's session. So now, now that I have it distributed amongst different devices, uh, if something happens to one of them, I still have collection from the other two. Uh, this also, by dividing it up like this, creates smaller files, which are much more manageable. Uh, it's scalable. I can, as I become more interested in other types of wireless technology, I just build a new Pi and then we build a new uh, a new ingest into it. Uh, so show you what some of that looks like. And I've got two examples here for single device characterization and AP characterization. And because this is not my first DEF CON, I'm not doing it live. <laughs> so what we have here is uh, this, the sample dashboard for uh, single devices. And we have the OUI of the devices that it sees, time of day analysis about when those devices are active, day of week, and I did all my collection on a Tuesday, so that's why it's all in one, one pot. Uh, probed SSIDs for client devices, so what Wi-Fi networks are they looking for? What access points have they been seen on? What protocols have been collected? And this is a video, this is not a live website, so I can't scroll, there we go. We got the uh, layers and the uh, types, of, um, types of protocols that we got collected, and this is all from uh, T-Shark or Wireshark. Uh, we got MDNS device names, we've got DHCP client names and operating system. We have user agent strings. We have MDNS information about the actual thing. Uh, and this is all from unencrypted wireless networks that are collected with Kismet that uh, Packet Glass actually will, will take out and uh, customize and, and contextualize. So that's what it can show for single devices. When we talk about access points, uh, when we talk about that, uh, here we've got dots on a map. This is from a drive that I took in uh, Washington, DC. Uh, here we got the top values of the access points, their encryption, their channel, uh, their bandwidth, uh, their capabilities. And it scrolls down and you can see there's lots of things. And then again, we get into more information about the network itself. So again, the chip manufacturer, uh, the, the BSID with the OUI lookup, the SSID list of the SSIDs we, we've seen what the router gateway IP address is, subnet mask, DNS server, information that the router is giving up uh, in an unencrypted network. And then there's also support for 802.11h, uh, the country code, country settings, so I can see what kind of country a, or what kind of frequencies a device is, is using, uh, the, what the WPS Wi-Fi protected setup information is about the manufacturer, about the uh, type of device, what clients are associated with it, uh, all kinds of information uh, related to the operation of that network. Again, all passively collected because I can collect all of the Wi-Fi's with, uh, with the Sparky box. So I'm gonna t turn it over to Winston. He's gonna tell you about the ones and zeros behind it all that actually make those pretty dots appear on a map. All right. Hey everybody, so uh, yeah, what, yeah, let's turn it, let's get this, uh, it blows up. Okay, button right there. Cool, right on. You know what do I? It doesn't look like it. There you go. There you go. Took a second. Good job. Cool, thanks. All right. So, uh, yeah, he collected a lot of data. Um, and a lot of them uh, were geodata. And uh, I'm just going to go over the specs, the planning, and the, kind of the execution of it. But overall, I kind of realized over the course of a conversation at a bar that uh, this is a uh, geo wireless processing hub from uh, multiple software. So like I said, uh, we kind of were just having a, uh, a chat, just drinking, and uh, he was telling me about all his wireless problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, and two and a half hours later, I was like, yeah, hold my beer, let me, let me do this. And uh, I signed on to do that. 
So the objective is to kind of like put dots on maps, right? Um, Jeff is doing everything in the number one column over there. He's collecting it from Kismet, Wiggle, um, Arrow Dump, a couple other formats. I'll mention more later. Um, so pretty much all my responsibility is in the number two section, the analytics platform. Um, at this point, as he was telling me all about it, I kind of had one in mind. Um, spoiler alert, it's, uh, it's Elk. And um, the, the goal is to make it easy for him to put uh, dots on maps. Um, pretty much change out maps or even visualization if he needs to. So like I was mentioning earlier, these are the type of different formats that he mentioned. Um, but just to give you an idea, the files I'll be actually be dealing with were like .kismets, .tsvs, SQLite, CAP, CSVs. Uh, maybe not everything uh, needs to be pre-processed, but um, as I was working on this, I was realizing I kind of have to consolidate everything down to one single format uh, that would work with Elk. So what is Elk? Uh, so overall, Elk is just this uh, open source-ish. Um, it's, it's a big asterisk there. Um, uh, analytics platform, uh, does real-time data collection. Um, e stands for Elasticsearch, L is Logstash, K is Kibano. Um, but what you really care about is the ingestion order is actually uh, from Logstash, that's where the data comes in. Uh, Logstash forwards it over to Elasticsearch into indexes, uh, where you will perform some kind of like tagging to let go, hey, this is how we're gonna retrieve the data, um, and so when you can actually look up, uh, do the searching later. Uh, and Kibana is where you do the visualization. So right out of the box, Elk doesn't really do what we need it to do. It doesn't know what a Kismet file is. Uh, it certainly doesn't know, um, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't really know how to use any of that data. Um, for example, maybe coming from Wiggle, we have something like called Trilat, a field called Trilat. And coming from Kismet, we have something called Latitude. Uh, we need to somehow let Elasticsearch know, hey, uh, these guys are the same thing. This is the type, same type of geodata. Uh, they also have a different data structure for all of these uh, files coming in. Uh, and lastly, um, the first party solution for Elastic Map is uh, Elastic Map Server. Uh, that costs money. And uh, I don't like to give money away. So uh, let's, let's do a free version of that. So this is a, a little diagram I drew up um, to kind of like handle the whole solution. Uh, the right side is uh, everything you saw. Uh, it's containerized uh, with Docker. Uh, in this case, we're just using Docker Compose. And uh, we also added the, a, a, map, a little map server on the right side there. Um, on the left-hand side is pretty much where most of the pre-processing happens. We're uh, using a Python script to just handle everything. Uh, and yeah, and we have like three directories that we'll uh, kind of go over in a little bit. So. The work ahead of us is pretty much to have, one, uh, stand up a copy of Elk, two, convert the files, three, we need to normalize the data field, four, uh, we need to tell how, how we're gonna use that data, and then five, we need somewhere, uh, even if we can put it on a coordinate space, some kind of mapping on the background to show, hey, where, are, where on the map are we? Because you can have coordinate system, but it doesn't necessarily have to translate to a map that, uh, you know, what, you can put anything you want behind there. All right, so great news about Elk. It already came pretty much uh, pre-assembled, right? Uh, if you uh, look for Docker Compose for Elk, um, they've already made it super easy. You, easiest thing you ever do is just download it, Docker Compose up D, you have it up and running. But like I said, it doesn't do anything yet. Um, but I do want to give like huge props to like Elk Ninja for making this like really frictionless. Um, I'm pretty sure that's actually the first party uh, GitHub project for them. All right, so talking a little bit about converting the files into a compatible format. Um, so like I said, we, I decided to do this in a Python script uh, outside of uh, the Elk stack. Um, so we have a ingest folder, an index folder, and an archive folder. We're pretty much dumping all of the data that we collected into an ingest folder where the Python script can be monitoring it. Um, and we can be monitoring for like Kismet files, SQL files, or whatnot. Um, and we kind of chose it for the, uh, the least amount of work that Jeff had to do. Um, so pretty much uh, as soon as he's exporting it, we want to have all the default settings. So uh, for, I think, Wiggle, it might be something as simple as like backup.sqlite. All right, so uh, the search pattern I'm looking for then is backup. You know, star SQLite um, for that Python script. Uh, if I have to convert it down, then I'll convert it down to JSON. And uh, if I don't have to, I pretty much just pass it along from a TSV or CSV and move it right along. 
Um, for the JSONs, there are there is a little kind of like a uh, log stash or elastic searchism, which is you pretty much have to convert all JSONs into a single line uh, per entry, uh, and this is for uh, elas elastic search efficiency reasons. Uh, so, you there is a multi-line format you can do, uh, but that like honestly, do you want to be less efficient? So here's an example of how we might uh, convert it from Wiggle. Uh, so the Python script is going to look for, okay, cool, I see a backup.sqlite. Um, and uh, we're going to just run this command. Uh, yeah, these are pre-fields, so this is kind of like slightly of a destructive editing. This is also why we also back up the originals. Um, but these are the fields that Jeff told me, hey, these, this is what I need. Great, awesome. You could, hey, I say select star and grab everything. Uh, but if you're not really needing to, uh, because the, the amount of data we're dealing with, we really want to just like cut down on size where we can. And same thing for Kismet as well. Uh, we're also dumping it out into a JSON file, and if it has a PCAP file, if, uh, we can like dump it out into a PCAP NG. Uh, and this is where we kind of ran into a little tricky thing. I tried using PacketBeat, and uh, PacketBeat is really it feels like it's more designed for any kind of like streaming or, or network monitoring. It's not really designed for this like individual file ingestion. So uh, what I decided to do was just have T Shark actually convert it back uh, from PCAP also into JSON. And that's also another step where we can do more filtering down so we can remove data that has absolutely uh, nothing to do with us. Because at first I was like, yeah, let's keep all the data. Uh, I think we wound up filling up that, what? We filled up a two terabyte drive. Yeah, uh, like in, in like a single session. So that was like, well, that's uh, let's not do that. Um, so yeah, we started looking for other types of traffic and things that we specifically wanted. So to, the, yeah, the next part is then we had to, uh, tag and normalize the data, right? So even though we bring it into Logstash, uh, so we moved it over from pre-processing into Logstash now. Logstash kind of needs a way to go, okay, what am I doing with this? So right off the bat, we're using the file plugin. Uh, and then for filtering, this is where I was talking about earlier. Um, this is how we let it know, hey, uh, or start transforming from, if Wiggle calls it uh, latitude or, uh, and Kismet calls it, uh, I don't know, try long or try lat or whatever, right? Uh, we're trying to give it a way to say, hey, we're gonna want consolidate all of this data type into one single naming field or a single field um, so that Elasticsearch knows how to use it. Um, and then, yeah, in the output, obviously we're just sending it over to Elasticsearch. And now that we are actually in Elasticsearch, we need to tell Elasticsearch, okay, cool, within this index, um, it doesn't, even though it's, we called it, say, location, right? It doesn't really know what location is yet. So here's where we actually define, hey, we called something, we made something called location, and we're gonna define it into a geo point. Um, now, geo point is something that's native to Elasticsearch, so it knows how to use that data. Um, because we gave it a lat and a long, um, and looks at it, it's like, oh, cool, this is an array, it has a lat and a long. Let's put that as a dot. Yeah, let's, let's put that somewhere on the map. Um, and that's pretty much how that works. And we have to repeat this process for every software that we want to do that. Um, but that's essentially the whole pipeline. And to tie the whole thing together, like I said, because we're not interested in um, you know, paying too much to do this, uh, we just decided to use MapTiler, which is another open source software that we can just grab that. Elasticsearch actually made it pretty easy where you can just either pop it in the settings or in an environmental variable when you run up or spin up Elasticsearch. Uh, for the case of using MapTiler, that's actually just the domain for a self-hosted self option for it. Um, and in this case, we're also using just OpenStreetMaps. Um, so that's how we're able to just like put tiles underneath uh, the coordinate system. Yep. So to wrap it up, I want to give some special thanks to Ming, the Packet Hacking Village Committee, for allowing us to present today. Uh, Elk Ninja for the work on the Dockerized uh, version of Elastic. Uh, Dark Matter for giving me the idea of how to build a large scale wireless collection rig. Uh, Dragorn, Weigel Project, Gaiakov Solutions for making all the software that powers this, uh, powers this, this system. Uh, my husband, Mark Winters, who helped me make this actually fit into a nice, pretty pre presentable form. Uh, Monkey user for letting us borrow a lot of his pictures for this amazing presentation. And Tyler Carper for his contributions with, uh, with Winston. Sweet. So, questions, comments, complaints, other things to begin with C. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I think if I heard correctly, you have three separate Yes. Do you do anything special? Do you take any special effort to synchronize the time between the three? Because I would imagine when you reintegrate 
Yep. Yep. So they get the, so they get their uh, time from the uh, NTP server whenever I connect them up, and then they have an RTC battery in there that's keeping that keeping that running. So I may lose a few seconds, but with what I'm doing, it, it's not really like I'm not looking for an exact one to one correlation. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I just grab it all. Yep. And then, and then afterwards, then I look for the anomalies. Then I look for the things that I, that I want to see. It's like, oh, that protocol looks interesting. Let's look more at that, at that device. Uh, so I've been able to find a lot of stuff through MDNS. I've been able to find a lot of stuff through um, DHCP requests, a lot of information about devices themselves, which has been really handy for that. Yep. They're, they're giving me the signal, so. Thank you.